Coming to you live from Brooklyn, New York. My first night in Brooklyn. This is where my grandparents came to this country to live out the American dream. This is where I'm coming to do something similar. Okay, I'm going to just hop into the episode, but I just want to make a quick announcement before that. Uh, let you know I am sticking with my theme song. I like it. It's too long. I get it. As soon as you hear the ba da ba da ba da da skip ahead three minutes if you don't want to deal with that and you want to just jump into the episode. Exciting announcements uh, I'll do on another on another episode. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of cool stuff happening. A lot of exciting shit. But for now, not that this isn't exciting too, but for now, let us uh, begin our discussion with the wise sloth. This is part one of a two-part discussion with that sloth. All right, welcome to episode 13 of Tripolar. I'm your host, Nico Manetti, and today I'm joined by Travis Hahn, better known on the internet as the wise sloth. Now, uh, Travis, why don't we start by, by uh, you want to tell everybody why you're a sloth? Um, I see Question on everybody's see. mind off the bat. I see laziness as efficiency. Interesting. Sounds Buddhisty. Uh, yeah, a little bit. There you are. We were wondering when you'd show up. Bipolar disorder is one of the most misunderstood and least well recognized of all mental illnesses. You are with us, or you are with the terrorists. There is a belief that bipolar disorder is linked to being gifted either in a creative sense or intellectual. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich! You know, many depression bipolar disorder is a very morbid condition. Pick up the phone and These stop doctors that. here, they, they will be the first to say it is not something to take lightly. Yeah, right. It's about elevating that conversation to a national level. And bring mental illness out of the shadows. We want to let people living with mental health challenges know that they are not alone. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad! I'm going Self-destructive man feels completely alienated. Utterly alone. He's an outsider. Why am I so difficult to quiet? He thinks to himself, well, I must be insane. Yes, you crack. Man wants chaos. If nothing else, I want to have created something real. Sporadic as my thoughts come, it's mind boggling. People are looking at me crazy. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy Kimmel, I said, I'm a creator genius. Right. Like, could you ain't supposed to say that. Supposed to say you that. You were diagnosed with bipolar disorder. How did you cope with that? You know, at first I was really angry. But then really happy, then furious, but then really cheered up. <laughs> I'm so glad you're cured. You're bipolar. Wow, what does that mean? What's the cure? Medicine? Make me like them? Yeah, right. Am I a Martian? Depression. There's a real demon in the woods, too. A lot of creative people. Go to the craft service table, you get a cup of coffee. Robin Williams is sitting by himself, totally depleted. Ah! And it didn't come for free. Surrender may be our only option. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, 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 bye. Do it. No! Never give up. Change is gonna come. Never surrender. On my watch. Yes, it is. Uh, the consensus is I'm bipolar. It's a little funny in the head. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? It ain't about how hard you hit. It's just a little. It's about how hard you can get hit. Funny. They keep moving forward. How much can take? They keep moving forward. They keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. 99% of all new income is going to the top 1%. The top one-tenth of 1% 1 owns almost as much as the bottom 90 
funny in the head. Uh, I'm by winning. I win here and I win there. Gentlemen. Welcome. I call myself the wise pot. Not as a statement saying, hey, look, y'all, I'm wise. It's, um, it's a personal value that I hold. I think that everybody should aspire to the highs, and we should all be writing down all the books of the collective wisdom that we've accumulated in our life. And that's a big part of what my blog is. It's kind of me preaching to people, but also it's just me collecting all the information that I've learned about life and cataloging it in a place. Yeah, and so that's why I came across Travis's blog online. I think it was through some random link on Reddit, and I read an article he'd written. I was really impressed by his writing style, and more so by just the thoughts he was having. And and he was he's a very deep thinker. And I hit him up. We we talked a little bit, kind of struck up a friendship, and he agreed to come on the show. And uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to have him on today. And we're going to explore some different things. Uh, the episode is going to be about America kind of just questioning if we're the good guy. Because Travis has what could be considered some pretty radical ideas on that topic. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll hop into that. And Travis, you explained this to me before, but I'll just tell people the reason you may kind of sound like you're on the verge of tears a lot, is that you have a, uh, you know, why don't you tell people what, what, what's going on with your voice? Um, it's a speech impediment. It's caused by a couple of different things. <clears throat> First, I was uh, born an identical twin, which meant that I was born premature. And I had uh, heart surgery, which kept me in the hospital for the first couple of months of my life at the time with the heating tube stuck down my throat. Um, and any doctor will tell you you can only shove a feeding tube down someone's throat long enough uh, before it's going to do some permanent damage. I actually, my voice was fine as a kid. It cracked whenever I was in uh, Air Force tech school back in uh, 2000. And I was the guy chanting next to the big groups of people marching and my voice blew out, and not only did it not uh, ever get better, it's just kind of gotten steadily worse since then. Really? So it wasn't always like that, huh? No. But it, it originated from when you were a baby, from the from the tubes, but it didn't re- the impediment didn't really kick in until later in life? Yeah, and then I also got, uh, as an adult, I had a lot of acid reflux, and so I also set it off. Huh. Okay. Well, I just thought it was worth noting so people, you know, know why you sound uh, sort of villainous. A little bit of, you sound like a little <laughs> bit of a villain. Like, yeah, uh, that, uh, that, like the guy in the last, that, that last Bond movie that uh, Javier Bourdain plays. Yeah. Did you watch that last Bond movie? Uh, No, I gave up a while back on the Bond movies. See, they it got really good with Casino Royale. The one after that was a piece of shit, and then uh, Quantum of Solace, and then after after that uh, there was a a good one. I forget the name. Skyfall. Skyfall. I I like that one. I like the bad guy in it. He was really cool. And um, I'm all about the bad guys. I, I like bad guys. Um, I, I like good bad guys. Um. And they say the key to writing a good bad guy is, is not to write him as a bad guy, but he sees himself as a good guy, you know? And that, that's a kind of something that will, I believe, just because I said it and I, and I, hopefully it will, <laughs> uh, tie into today's episode, this idea of a bad guy can see himself as a good guy and vice versa. So I think that we should take a look because, because you're a wise guy and I'm a wise guy in a different sense of the word, maybe. <laughs> And together we can kind of look at this and say, what's where, where does this come from, our idea that we're the good guy and they're the bad guy? Uh, do, do they, they being whoever we're against, 
see it the same way, that they're the good guy, we're the bad guy, probably. And um, what? Are, how do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of the actions that our country takes? Uh, should we go along with it? Where do we draw lines? It's a very tricky thing to to make sense of, and and it's very traumatic, I think, to look at your your own country's history in a objective way, because it it's like finding out that your dad did some fucked up things back in the day. And you you really respect your dad, you love your dad, you your whole life you really want to be like your dad, and then you find out he did some fucked up things, and it's it changes your relationship maybe. So I don't know what. Uh, why don't you talk on why you're so critical of America? Well, I'm critical on everybody, and uh, I mean I talk about. I think we should all be critical on everybody. There shouldn't be any safe topics that are taboo that we can't question. I actually wrote a blog called Patriotism is Not a Virtue. We we don't owe anything to – we don't owe any in, intellectual faith in our government. Our government was created for us, not us for it. It's our baby. It's our creation. It's there to serve us. We aren't there to serve it. And really, any idea that you believe about anything, your country, your religion, your culture, everything is just information that we've picked up about the world around us. Um, that's just for us to choose and examine. It's all inert data that we should all be looking at like scientists and picking apart. If we can't just hold on to all of our old ideas and just beat them into our children's head for here until eternity, if that's what we'd always done, we'd all still be living in caves, teaching each other how to kill rats. <laughs> it's only by fixing our old ideas, by critically analyzing the stuff that's most sacred to us, that we can improve the stuff that's the most sacred to us. What you just said ties into something that came up in uh, of my last episode with uh, one of my professors. His name is Barney McGrain. And we talked about how the power of stories. Uh, that Aristotle once said that it was either Plato or Aristotle. Fucking, I, I always confuse the two. said those who tell stories rule society. And I believe that human beings are very dependent on stories because it's how we make sense of reality. And I think what you're saying is we need to question the stories that we're told and that we don't owe it to, I don't know, to ourselves, to our government to just go along with the story we were told without critiquing it and really coming to understand the truth behind it. Is, is that a stretch or is that kind of on the money? No, that's on the money. Um, but talking about critiquing the ideas that we were raised with, the ideas of our culture, the ideas of our government, it's worth taking a pause and thinking about the fact that our brains were designed with to learn what's given to us and repeat it. That's how culture is passed down. We sit around campfires and tell stories, and that's how we learn about things, and that's all we know about the universe. Nobody mm -hmm. knows the ultimate answer of the meaning of life and what it's all going to. So, a lot of, of people think they do. <laughs> yeah, they, that's a whole other topic. But, um,. So we're, gene we're genetically designed to take the information we're given and just run with it. Um, patriot over patriotism and close-mindedness about your religion or not thinking critically about anything that you've been taught. That's not like a horrible, horrible, disgusting character flaw that we should make fun of people for doing and that we should hate ourselves for. 
that's just an inherent part of human nature. That's who we are and what we do. Um, saying that someone is a bad person for doing that is like saying that guys are bad for being horny. Right. It's just what we do. We can't stop that. Uh, but we can, what we can do is understand that part about ourselves and do the best that we can to take these instincts that do serve a purpose. I mean, we patriotism has helped us. Holding on to ideas has helped us survive as a species, but we need to master it and not let it master us. Right. Yeah, I would argue that without patriotism and without our dependency on stories, uh, we would have gone extinct as a species because what stories do is, is it puts us on the same wavelength. It's like we implicitly agree to a bunch of things that we weren't there to see, that we, we we take things on faith when we accept a story as being true. And when everyone around us agrees to that same story, now we can act kind of as a unit because we we have just – and I'm talking in very broad terms right now. But like you said, the guy at the campfire, he comes up, he tells a story. Everyone's like, yeah, I like that. So let's tell our kids that story. And now everyone knows the same story, so now we can kind of – agree on things and now we can work together to do xyz and where patriotism comes in i think is that we're a collection of people we have certain stories traditions customs that come from whatever the source is maybe it's a prophet maybe it's a uh you know like we have the founding fathers are kind of like like the god of our political religion i would say to to put it in a, a weird way i guess but that fosters patriotism, our, our ability to absorb and retell stories. So without that, I, I think that we would, we'd be goners because humans evolved because we work together, unlike a lot of animals who are very powerful, but they, they never developed the capacity to really cooperate. And so there's, there's a lot of good that comes with patriotism and, and all that, that the problem lies when we like what you're saying in in your writings and right now the problem comes when we fail to question that or fail to question who's telling the stories and fail to realize the power they have if we go along with it without uh you know fact checking so i think that what you're doing is pretty bold and that you are you're making some very, very strong critiques about a country that I've never even heard before. And so let's 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 go a little more specifically into what you see as the defining characteristics that, that would make you view American history in a light that most Americans never would. Um Actually, I should also, also preface this by saying you were in the military. You were, you know, you're not some like just out there Michael Moore kind of, you know, fuck America guy. Like you, you were in the military. You served after 9/11. You actually, you know, well, I joined before. I joined before September 11th. I was yeah, but you served the, after 9/11. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I reenlisted. Um, I was in the Air Force as a computer technician from 2000 to 2007. Um, and when I came out of base training, I was totally gung-ho. I just, I ate, slept, and breathed blue. Um, <laughs> I lost my faith in the American system very reluctantly. Um, I didn't just start out as a um, stereotypical liberal college kid who didn't know anything about anything and was just spouting the last thing his freshman sociology teacher taught him. <laughs> um, I wanted to have faith in America, and I grew up with faith in America, and I lost my faith chip by chip over time. But my critiques about, I mean, about you know, the military and America, they're not, I don't think, I don't think they're that extreme. 
Um, well, they're very unique. I've never heard these the the way you critique it uh, so specifically in terms of of seeing it as this sort of. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say conspiracy because whether or not you believe in conspiracies, you believe in conspiracies. Is something I once said. Uh, well, the thing about the American government is the only we all have conspiracy theories about America. I mean, America has a hundred billion dollar top secret military network that spans the entire globe, has top network top secret uh, nodes all over the place, full of top secret information, locked behind doors with ice scanners uh, and cipher box and people standing in front of them with machine guns that the American public will never, ever be able to go behind. We will never, ever be able to go into the White House in their, into the war room, into the secret briefings and find out what is actually going on. We are all Unless we get elected. Apart. You and I were both class <laughs> presidents. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's impossible that one of us becomes, a, you know, a guy who gets in the war room. But well, no, I hear what you're saying. But if, <laughs> even if you did get in the war room, I mean, they have a saying in the – You can't fight in there. You can't fight in the war room. I know that. I didn't know that. Doctor um, Strange Love reference. You ever seen that movie? Which one? Doctor Strange Love? It's a Stanley Kubrick movie. Yeah, but I saw it ages ago. I, one of my favorite movies. But go ahead. Um, but the point is, our government is so secret. All we top do is come up with conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories about what's going on. I mean, it's a yeah, that's fact. true. I mean, there clearly are conspiracies going on because. They just say it's secret. Where did top secret even come from? It's I I knew it since I played Goldeneye, you know, since we were like video games. I knew there was a thing called top secret, and it was like it's a very cool phrase. It's very sexy. It's like this this is just shit that like nobody can know except for you. It's actually not sexy. But I wonder. I always wondered who decides like. What's secret? What's not? Because like after nine eleven, after the Patriot Act was passed, I think unless I'm misrepresenting this, it basically that gave them a a get out of jail free card to to just say anything that could be incriminating was secret and would you know compromise our national security. So we can't bring that up in court. Uh, so it it really gave the military like pretty much like you know, immunity from from civil procedures because they can just literally take like a black marker and put it on the document and then just say, put a stamp on it that says top secret and it's like fucking, you can't look at this. Sorry, man. Yeah, the military uh, absolutely operates outside of the Yeah, so it's like we have no. a fourth branch of government, really. The military's essentially its own branch. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's fair to say. Which the president's supposed to be in charge of the military, which, I mean, I don't see how that's even possible because you have a new president every four years. It's like, who's really running it? You know, you have a guy who's calling shots, maybe. It's like you bring in a new head coach, but it, but the team's there, and, and it's a question of who's running things. Uh, despite whoever the president is, and and that's that's very formally organized. But like you said, there's so much black money, and uh, black money. I don't mean like money used to to buy rims and and uh, speakers and that sort of thing. I mean money that's off the books. <laughs> dark money is maybe what you should call it. Uh, there's so much dark money, and 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 we know this, and we know the Pentagon spends a fortune, uh, unfathomable amounts of money on things that we have no right to know. Uh, at least that's the story we're given: is that look, you don't fucking, you don't want to know. Like it's it's none of your business. We're just gonna do what we got to do. It's for your own good. We're keeping you safe, and that's where all these skunk works programs come from. We get a lot of cool shit. I feel like the American people are just like. As long as it's cool, I'm all right with it. Like, you know, if you, as long as we got like stealth bombers, we got like spaceships with cool lasers, you know, well, that's as long as there's cool shit, like I'll, I'll, I'll excuse it. 
the messed up thing about that is all of this stuff is paid for with taxpayer dollars that nobody agreed to. Nobody said, all right, we're going to give True. you a blank check for $10 right. trillion. Dollars. Just take $10 trillion of our tax dollars and just spend it on whatever mystery stuff you want to. And how do you even, how do you even conceptualize $10 trillion? Like if you were to draw that number, if you were to write that number out, that would have how many zeros? Because a billion has what, nine? So that would have like 12 zeros. It's just like, it's hard to even imagine a numbers that big. The way I think of it is like, okay, a million dollars is a lot of money. If I had a thousand million dollars, I have a billion dollars, right? So I would have to have, what, like a million million dollars to have a trillion? And you multiply that times 10? It's, and it, and it's just like, at that point, it's like, wh- is that even money? It, you're just, that's like everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but it's just like that's an unreal amount of money when you compare it to the, like, for example, the funding that's given for the things we expect our tax money to go toward. That's, yeah. you know, that's far yeah. in excess of what we think are, that, that we're funding and what we're agreeing to as citizens. Yeah. The way I try to conceptualize $10 trillion is thinking, how many homeless shelters could $10 trillion build? I thought um, you were going to say blow up. <laughs> no, I was just making a joke. Go ahead. I didn't catch it. Well, I just said I thought you were going to say how many uh, homeless shelters could $10 trillion blow up. Oh, uh, that's another way to conceptualize it. But no, how many? How many could it? How many could it make? How many homeless shelters could you blow up for ten trillion dollars? No, no, build like what you were what you were thinking. Um, enough to house every homeless person in the entire world. In the world? Yep. Wow. So That's so instead making. of instead of the military stuff that we don't even know about, right? You're saying that we could essentially shelter everyone in the world. Yes, I would say that. And even that sounds even crazy, if that, I think you're right. And that's just one example. We don't have to get hung up on that. Maybe it could happen, maybe it couldn't. But here's another thing to think about. Um, like a F-22 costs about $22 million. Uh, the F-35 is obscenely more than that. Um, right. You think about how much a, a stealth bomber, and we're not even talking about just I a think couple they of cost, airplanes in the Air Force. I want to say they cost like a couple billion a stealth bomber. I might be I'm wrong, saying, but I'm uh, pretty I think sure. I might be right. I'm but, pretty sure because uh, I know it's the most expensive plane there ever has been. The point is, how much money would it cost to build an online school that had interactive classes for every single subject conceivable? that would just make our current university system obsolete and give complete free education to every person on the planet. I think we you're could, definitely south we, of a trill on that. <laughs> we could build that with a fraction of our military's budget, and that would fix exponentially more problems than bombing goat herders in Afghanistan will. Yeah, no, and that's a beautiful point. I think that there's an inherent sense of uh, pussiness when you talk about how we should be spending our money to help people instead of kill people. Like, you know how, do you ever watch the, the movie Team America? Yep. I actually Amazing watched movie. that whenever, I watched that whenever I was stationed in Kuwait. Really? <laughs> it's, it's, I don't, I, I sound like I have a million favorite movies, but that's one of my favorite comedies. I think that's a brilliant movie because it, uh, at the end, it culminates with the speech where the uh, main puppet, the, they're not people, the, but <laughs> the main puppet in the movie says that there's three types of people. Um, there's dicks, there's pussies, and there's assholes. Now, the pussies are mad at the dicks for being dicks, but the, uh, you know, because, cause, what was it? The pussies are mad at the dicks for being dicks because dicks fuck pussies, but pussies 
uh, need dicks because dicks also fuck assholes. And, uh, you know, the assholes will, will shit on everybody. So the pussies need the dicks, but the dicks need the pussies to remind them not to be too much of a dick. So uh, it's a great uh, analogy. And I think that when we're talking about, like, doing nice things, we sound like pussies, you know, because it implies that, oh, well, you're not aware of the danger or you're you're living in a fantasy land to think that we can help people who are a threat to us. But really, if you think about it, and any I think anyone would agree with this, that if we were to educate and connect and um, help people, there's going to be a lot less enemies to fight because look at the people we're fighting. They're, they just happen to be in places where they're in poverty and when their education is terrible and when it's dominated by totalitarian regimes and really regressive religious ideologies. And these are all things that like people grow up in and of course, that's their environment and that's their world. So of course they become someone that you would consider an enemy. But if we were to take all the money we're, we're using to, to just be ready to kill all these people and we were to improve their life, you know, it's it, it's not a stretch to say that's probably a better investment in terms of actually protecting us from them, even from a completely self-interested standpoint. Even if we didn't give a shit about anyone outside our country, it's probably better for our national defense to go around doing nice shit, right? I absolutely agree with you, and that cuts to the heart of my perspective on America that you say is extreme. My position is that America isn't a dick. America is the asshole. <laughs> and the whole reason we have all these war-torn places with dictators in place uh, and military strife all over because America has spent the last century destabilizing every major – every geographical area of the planet. We had the CIA overthrowing governments uh, in Latin America since, since the 40s. And these are all well-documented. I mean, they're on Wikipedia. These aren't conspiracy theories. Um, it's on Wikipedia. Checks out. Well, uh, it is very well documented. You're right. These aren't myths. They're things that are through the Freedom of Information Act. I think you could even look at a lot of the shit, like even what the CIA guys were, well, were doing. It's definitely true. Have, we fuck around in other places about it, like yeah, I, like uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Economic right, I've heard about that book. It's, and and there's a guy who worked for the government who went around helping overthrow government in Latin America, well, all over. To make these places, make these environments friendly to American economic interests. Hmm. So it's and basically a shakedown. It's like a, it's like yeah. a mafia shakedown. Like they come in, they say, "Hey, you know, you want some protection? We're willing to protect you. Uh, you're just going to need to kind of help us out here. Give us a little bit of a tribute. Maybe open up your borders to let our guys come in and set up shop." They want to do a few things, take all your resources, that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, you know, are you all right with that? And we'll make you a rich man. Well, you got to go on a case by case basis with these countries. They're all different, but the end goal was basically the same. If you take Latin America or you take um, Southeast Asia, like around the Vietnam War, or you take the Middle East, these places were big powerhouses that were – they were creating goods. They had industry. They were coming up. Um, they were building strong governments, and they were building strong companies. And America went in. With a touch here and a push there, they put in dictators here, and they bribed people, and the war on drugs just in general just by mandating the – Drugs be illegal. Um, they yeah, we forget that that's international. The war on drugs. That's not just oppressing our own people. Like they were, especially when it started, they were literally like fucking bombing 
places and going and killing people who are making drugs. And yeah, the war making drugs illegal has failed everywhere it's happened. But every place mm-hmm. makes drugs illegal because that's one of the conditions that they have to meet to to get good trade deals with America. If they right. make drugs legal, they're going to lose paper and it's going to cost their people money and hurt their economy. So America is forcing the rest of the world, minus pretty much just Portugal and Holland, we're about the only two places that just gave America the finger and said, fuck it, we're going to do what we want. <laughs> but everybody else has had to recreate this failed drug war that caused chaos in their own country because America told mm-hmm. them they had to. And it's not because America's stupid. There's not – everybody knows that the war on drugs is a failure everywhere. Do you think it's um, just an excuse to justify force? I think that it's in America's best economic interest for as much of the world to be in chaos as possible. <laughs> well, I'm, just because... wondering, I'm just wondering if the war on drugs could be seen as an excuse for the government to – essentially target whoever they want. Because you look at who's actually uh, affected by this war, you see minorities, you see poor people. You, in terms of who's actually cracked down on and who's, you know, no crack pun intended, who's cracked down on and who's incarcerated. And, you know, it's like they have this wide selection of laws they can choose to prosecute you under if they feel like it. And they know everyone wants drugs because drugs, are, you know, make you feel good and people and they're everywhere. So it's it's easy to find. It seems like something that has nothing to do with the government. I mean, it, it, there's no way you could really argue that someone deciding to intoxicate themselves is it really like a threat to the whole country or I guess you could make an argument, but you know what I mean? And internationally, like you're saying, like we're going to tell some fucking guy in in Spain that you can't smoke a joint because like America said so. I mean, you're right. We're assholes. The messed up thing about uh, making drugs illegal is because I think it's more – the justification on the books is more we're going to protect you from hurting yourself because you can get – you can go to – Hell for just having you know an ounce of weed on you. That's not going to hurt you. Well, that's else. the that's, that's the you. claim, but I don't believe it because if if the government was so compassionate about caring if we hurt ourselves, like wouldn't they just improve our general situation more? I think that it's an excuse to be able to keep us down. I think so also because look what happens when you do go to jail for weed. You get a criminal record. You get raped. Uh, your whole life is just the government by sending you to jail for having weed is effectively shooting you in the head to protect you from shooting yourself in the foot. That's a great metaphor. And that's You're right. helping anybody and they know that. They know that, yeah, absolutely. And like if you I think what you're able to do is something that, that I'm trying to get better at doing and that's to remove yourself from Actually, this is interesting because it ties into the theme of the show. Remove yourself from yourself is kind of what tripolar means. Because I'm bipolar, I'm trying to develop the ability to look at myself from a more objective standpoint and and prevent myself from making rash decisions when I'm in a manic or depressed state. And I think uh, on a macro perspective, we need to be able to do that as citizens of a country. We need to be able to look at the actions that our country is taking internationally and locally and say, objectively speaking, what is the reality here? And the reality is we have a system where, like you said, a teenager who's smoking marijuana, which I highly recommend, uh, will will can literally be – guys can show up at his house, kick down his door, shoot his dog, lock him up, put him in a car, take him to a court, they bang a gavel, he goes to a prison – like you said, he gets anally raped. I was in law school, and we were talking about this in my criminal justice class. And we were talking about how you know, it's like a punchline that you're going to get raped in jail. It's like a joke. But it, but how fucked up is that? That, that, that yeah. We know that happens, and it's like used as a deterrent. It's like, hey, you don't want to get raped in the ass, right? Put that doobie down. And so you're going to take people. You're going to put them in a place where they get raped. 
and then you're gonna you're gonna let them be surrounded by other criminals. Many all your rapists, all your murderers, all your people who need mental health treatment, but there's no place for them, so they just put them in jail. You know, a lot of these places are run for profit. We won't even get into that because it's true, but it sounds fake. And then you take these guys, they come out of jail, they can't get a job because they have a criminal record. All the shit they know is criminal based now. They become criminals. They go to jail again and again, and they get killed. And they, you know, and we and we look at this and we and we wonder, you know, like why are all these black people committing crimes? What? And not even black people. It's just like how how are we the country that claims we're we're the freest country in the world, and we have the and most we have the prisoners highest prison yeah. in the world, not even by percentage in the world. We have like just by the numbers. China has less yeah. people in jail than America, and their population is so much greater. It's like yeah, I don't know. I don't know what other criteria you can go by. So once you've reached, once you have the most people in prison out of any country in the world, you officially can't call yourself the land of the free. I mean, that is by definition. Yeah. No, it's false opposite. advertising. It's false advertising at this point to say we're the land of the free. We're and we're the land of the of the you know fucked right now. Incarcerated apparently. Yeah, the land of the locked is a better is a better description I think. And like and we, you know, it's not just us, it's... that we don't that we don't. Um, I, I'm so glad to see politicians like Bernie Sanders is the only guy I see really taking stabs at this point. But what does it say about us that we've let this happen, that that we've just kind of allowed this to build up around it? And, and does it just stem from a fear of our own government that, like you said, is supposed to be there to serve us? Well, we didn't know it was happening. It just one, one day, all of a sudden, prisons started popping up on the stock market, private prisons that profited off of having more people in jail started getting on the stock market. And we're like, what? Yeah, it's it sounds like an onion story. It's but it's it's reaching a point of just absurdity, and it's terrifying because think about it. Like imagine if you were arrested tomorrow for a drug charge, and you literally had to go to be locked up in a room for like a, a year. Like that like could you imagine? That's and and then everyone just forgets about you. Everyone just pretends you never existed. And then you come yeah. out of that experience. I mean, I'm already fucked up. If I were to go to jail and come out, I'd be even way more fucked up. And I just, it, it's really sad that that's a thing. And 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 yeah, there's things, there's so many things like that about our country that if we do take a close look, I mean, it's readily apparent. You don't even have to leave the country to get other people's perspective. They'll all tell you this, but you. You look at that and you say, "What the fuck are we doing here?" You know, and it, and I'm ashamed that my country is that, because I know it wasn't always that. I know it was never meant to be that, and I know that all no American I know wants this to be the reality. So the question is, if we're in a democracy and no one wants this, why do we have it? We're not a democracy. Where are we? Uh, um, you call us an oligarchy, or if you want to be creative about it, you can call us a corporatocracy. Let's go with uh, oligarchy, because corporatocracy sounds like uh, something Michael Moore would say. So, oligarchy is controlled by a small number of people, and <laughs> it's. I'm not gonna point specific fingers. Um, I'm not gonna state facts when I don't have enough information to right. come to the final conclusion. Um, so I don't know who exactly is sitting behind that big locked door making all the decisions, but I can tell you that all of our politicians are just professional speakers. They're professional mm -hmm. campaigners. Uh, they work for whoever gives them the most biggest campaign donation and whoever gives them the biggest lobbying gift. <laughs> so the people with the most power have the most power in government. 
the people who don't have any money, the people who can't even pay the phone bill, they have no power in government. Your vote is not power in government. The only true power in government is money. And about 400 people control 99% of the wealth in the country. So mathematically speaking, it's got to be some or most or all of them. Wow. And that's another fact that you can bring up and it's hard to even believe because it just sounds absurd. You know, it it really just sounds absurd that, that that's true. And, and it is. It's absurd and it's true. And we have 99% of all the money, the thing we need to get shit and have you know, get services, get to 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 live. The thing we need to prevent ourselves from living on the streets. Ninety nine percent of that thing, literally four hundred dudes have. Like, like you could fit the those guys in a fucking high school recital audience. The fucking guys who have ninety nine percent of that. Yeah, that would be that would be an abysmal turnout, even for a Nickelback concert. <laughs> Yeah. To put that in perspective. Yeah, people are going to remember that. An abysmal nickel back concert <laughs> could contain the people who literally have all the power. I mean, 99%, and it may even be more than 99%. They say it's even a percent of, like a certain percentage of a percent. And my next question is why has Bernie Sanders not been assassinated? If that's all true, which it is, and he's the only he's the one who basically i mean I could be wrong, but I never heard that statistic until he said it and it, and I've looked into it, and it is true, and now other people are saying it, and the campaigns they're all kind of talking about it because and that's proof that it is true, otherwise all the other candidates would be like, "Ah, oh, Bernie, you know that's cute, but here's the reality no they're all they're all on the same Bernie didn't. Yeah, Bernie didn't come up with that statistic. That statistic That's the first time I heard it. But like, he it seems like he's the one who's brought that to to the public, uh, just through his campaign right now. Um, it, I would say it was the Occupy Wall Street protests that really mm. brought that to the public. If that okay. hadn't happened, I'm just late to the party. Then, I guess. Uh, I guess. But yeah, they were the first people to bring up the mass. I mean, that was the first time it really hit mainstream news that how bad economic inequality had gotten in this country. Yeah. And, and so President Obama was in the White House when that happened. And in his mm-hmm. campaign speeches, he said, hey, if you're going to go on strike and strike for workers' rights, I'm going to put on my walking shoes and walk with you. Right. And – so when the Occupy Wall Street protest happened, I was like, oh, great. Obama's going to come down here. The, the great black hope. Indiana Jones in the rain. He's going to come down there and walk with him. Right. He just sat by idly while these people who were disorganized, and there was violent elements within it, but the people, the angst was coming from a real place, mm-hmm. from real world factors. They had a serious point that really needed to be addressed. You know, it was big enough to get that many people, thousands and thousands of people, sleeping on tents in the streets for months at a time. Yeah. And Obama, he left his walking shoes in Chicago, apparently, because I never saw him just, out there. Yeah, he just uh, he kept sipping champagne on Air Force One while all police across the country chased Tased, beat, and paced. Old women, little kids, uh, freaking everybody. They just went apocalyptic. They uh, shot a gas canister at this one veteran's head in Oakland and fractured his skull. <laughs> when I saw uh, the police, you know, sending veterans to the hospital, and Obama just sat by and did nothing. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that was a big uh, that was a big blow to my patriotism. Cause that's not, yeah, absolutely. That's could not the could Obama have done anything? 
Do you think Obama could have done anything? Because I, I have a theory that Obama really was a good guy coming in. I look at the pre-White House Obama. He's a good-looking, you know, he's a good-looking, wonderful public speaker with a glint in his eye. And, you know, he's he's ready. Like, I remember seeing his inauguration speech uh, and, and just, like, tearing up because I was just like, oh, my God. You know, like, a savior has I, risen. And, I had and then no you illusion. look at him. Walking out, you look at the Obama leaving. Like now, when he talks, he just says, "Um, like he doesn't even give a fuck anymore." Like he just, like a a high school uh, speech coach would give him like a B minus on his speech at this point. Like he doesn't even give a fuck. You can see that like it broke him, Washington. And I wonder what happened behind those closed doors. Like who, since it's true that ninety nine percent of the of the uh, money is held by four hundred people, and those people pretty much control the the congress who's those are the people obama has to deal with you know what i wonder what happened that made obama such a such a little bitch when it came to to these issues and and these causes that he was he fully you know gave the impression he was going to address all right well so check this out so in this election Donald Trump is running for president. He's a billionaire. He's got about six billion, six or eight billion dollars. Sixty-eight. Um, Sixty-eight billion. Let's get it no, right. No, that's no six or eight. You yeah, carry the zero. You round it up when you factor in. It's sixty-eight. But go ahead. No, you're right. It's sixty-eight. He's like that about his money, though. He's, he's I think Bill it. Gates has Bill Gates has about sixty-eight billion. Donald Trump. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, Donald Trump. He should fucking run for president. I've done way too many drugs to. No, not you. I said Bill Gates. Oh, uh, I don't think that. I no? I wouldn't support that. But that's yeah, he's kind of a nerd. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. All right. So think about this. So Donald Trump used to donate money to Hillary Clinton's campaign. He donated right. a lot of money. He donated so much money to her. The only kickback that he's ever admitted to is that he asked her to come to his uh, son's birthday party, I think it was. And so she came to his birthday party. And sucked his dick, uh, probably. <laughs> she's not getting it from Bill. Yeah, she, so she sucked uh, Donald Trump's son's dick in exchange for all that money. And um, go on. So, so this is just – this is one little tiny – Example of what money will buy you if you donate to a politician's campaign. <laughs> now, when Obama won his presidency, he had the most effective marketing campaign basically in history. His marketing campaign swept the marketing awards that year. They won all the top honors because um, Barack Obama raised $1 billion. For his uh, presidential campaign, he's got one billion dollars worth of papers that he owes to somebody who has a billion dollars. Not one person, but well, here's what <laughs> I, mean, I always: How many millionaires had to donate so much money to get into a billion sure. dollars? Sure. Yeah, no, he Obama had to be a telemarketer of the highest caliber. I'll, you know, and I respect that as a former telemarketer, but. I mean, what I always wondered is why don't politicians just renege on all those promises they make to fucking donors? They renege on all the promises they make to voters. If I were a politician, uh, I would I would take all that money and be like, yeah, man, I'm looking, you know, don't worry about that oil thing. I got it taken care of. Yeah. Don't worry about those laws. They're gonna get uh, off the books. You know, I'm gonna get you this. And then I'd be like, yeah, fuck you guys. Thanks for the money. I'm gonna I'm gonna serve the people. How come that well, doesn't? Work? The reason that doesn't happen is because you would be a one-term politician. That's fine. I'd have one good term. I'd get shit done for one term. I'd tell everybody to go fuck themselves. And then the next time, maybe everyone will vote for me because I did such a good time the first time. You, you know you what know, I mean? What's going to happen... What's gonna I want happen, the right kind of liar in office is what I'm saying. I'm sure there's a lot of people who have attempted to stand up to the common good. And then mm -hmm. after they reneged on their dollars... Nobody else donated to them, and they donated all their money to their competitors' campaign. And so regardless right. of what the truth is, 
the truth, I mean, the truth can only be what people know. And if you don't have any money to tell people anything and mm. all of your old sponsors are backing another guy, letting the media with their message, their message is the only message going to be heard. And that's going to be the truth in people's eyes. And then, well, and we're not even factoring in the possibility, the probability. I would say that these politicians and these, like, military people have at their disposal the uh, ability to assassinate the guy at any point. I mean, we saw it happen with JFK, and that wasn't just. And I don't know who assassinated JFK, but uh, I think Lyndon Johnson was behind it personally, but I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, but no, you know, like we're not even factoring in the possibility that there's a very real death threats to these guys if they do renege on, on their uh, yeah. promises to the, to the bad guys. You know what I mean? You know, and even a president could be replaced with somebody else with a lookalike. How many Saddam Hussein had like 26 lookalikes. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I that's like, true. I won't, I won't go out, I won't actually say that's ever happened in American politics, but is so Obama could lost. be a cyborg, is what you're saying? Yeah, something like that. He could. They could have just harvested Obama's DNA, created an Obama cyborg, and then he's been. That's why he's. You know, seems so so bleak. And it would I, be a know. lot easier just to give somebody else a facelift, a lot of money, and a lot of press. I guess either way. Um, either way, they have to play ball. One way or the other, our politicians have to play ball with the people who fund their careers. And so it's not really our politicians running the place. It's the people they're beholden to. And let's talk Let's talk a little bit about our current presidential race because it's a big one. It's an important one. We all know it. I think the public's more invested in this race than maybe they've ever been. And at the same time, the most disappointed because the candidates are, you know, so weird. But I think that it's an election people really care about because look at I how far out we are. It's like two years out. I think people out. care about it as much as people care about it. And the debates have been breaking world record or been breaking American records for debate viewership. Right. <laughs> but I think people should be even more concerned with it. Because basically, as far as I'm concerned, World War III is currently in progress in the Middle East. Oh, shit. What Syria. is World War? What, 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 would, what constitutes a World War? Multiple when everybody in the world nations. is fighting. And everybody in the world is fighting in the Middle East. We've got two of the biggest world superpowers on opposite sides of the Syrian conflict. We've America has all pretty much all the Europeans and, and other people fighting along. It has had all these people fighting along its side. Right. The, middle, the war. Its alliances is what causes world wars. And then, it, it's uh, intertangled alliances that it's like a domino effect. So yeah, what you're saying that's is exactly. True. That is I'm terrified of what's going on in Syria because like we I'm caused it. Also. There's no doubt that we caused ISIS. We, I mean, you could look in detail and you could see that they used the excuses of the weapons of mass destruction to get into Iraq, you know, destabilize the region. We essentially laid the groundwork for ISIS. Uh, there's even way more specific ways we did that, but we're directly responsible for the rise of ISIS. Now we're fighting yeah. them and and we're playing this stupid fucking game of whack-a-mole. And whoever is running things in the White House, I don't even know. Because everyone in America, I guarantee 9 out of 10 people would be like, stop fucking around in Syria, in the Middle East. You know, like, just stop fucking with it. None of those guys are on our side. Do not go up against Russia. Do not, You know what I mean? Like, this is a maybe a critical moment for for us, like, as people who just have some sort of voice, to say kind of ring some warning alarms and say, like, look, we're in a situation that's that could be, like you're saying, a, a World War Three sparker. Because if you get Russia and no, America... No, I would say World War Three is out, already happening. I think, think it's history, already... Like, in the history books, they will look at this and say, like, yeah, so it started yeah. in 2014 or whatever. Yes. 
Falk. Ah, well, we, we're in it. we got to win. I'm going to go on list. All right, and that's going to do it for part one of episode 13 of Tripolar with special guest Travis Hahn, a.k.a. The Wise Sloth. Tune in next time. Bye-bye now.